Uh, hello, uh, my name is Mark Miodovnik. I'm a material scientist um, and uh, at UCL, just down the road from here, and um, a director of the Institute of Making. Um, and I want to talk about material science and innovation and materials. But this is, yeah, this is just a picture of London, and you can pick out the materials, and that's that's where we've come from. This is what we make cities out of, and it's it's really impressive. Each one of those materials was created by us. That's who we are. If you want to know who human, human civilization is, it's this. That's a mirror on us. And it's, it's as complex as a tropical jungle. It's an urban environment which we've created so that we are human. Take it all away. Take all your clothes or this building, and we're all going to be sitting in a muddy field, especially in London. So it's to be really applauded. It really is a wonderful thing to have done. And, and what, you can say many things about this, but one of the things it's very clear is that we are makers. That's where we've come from. The first sort of ape-like descendant who became a human is the person or thing <laughs> who just decided to get out of the rain and transform some materials into a shelter or create metal tools. So each, each, that's why we celebrate the ages of civilization, right? We have the Stone Age, we have the Copper Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, because the materials themselves represented a different era in our own existence in human civilization. And you're wondering, can we, do we really have to celebrate all of them? Shouldn't we regret some of them? I've got a little um, pointer here. I'm, gonna just, I'm just going to have a look at this one here. So amalgams, and that's in this guy's mouth. And I'm willing to bet pretty much everyone in this audience has got a few of those in their mouth. So these are metals which solved a problem, which was toothache. For thousands and thousands of years, all of our ancestors ate and got toothache, got cavities, and the only solution was to go to the local blacksmith, <laughs> who not only was you know, the heart of the agricultural uh, economy and also um, created all the kind of tools and, and weapons and, and armor and that sort of thing, but was the person who was going to pull your tooth out uh, because you were in so much pain. And there was no other solution. That was it. They tried moss. They tried pouring tin, lead in there. None of it worked, because what you wanted was a material that would bung up the hole, protect your nerve, stay there for tens of years, be as hard as the dentine in your mouth, so not grind down. And they didn't have anything like that. They tried cement, all these things, didn't work. And they, what they really wanted was a piece of metal that would exactly fit the hole, and that meant pouring in something liquid or putting something liquid in there. But then they wanted it immediately, it was in there, to harden and become stone-like for the rest of your life. And they had a material that was a bit like that. It's called mercury. They discovered it. And they started mucking about with it. And hey, presto, <laughs> uh, if you add a bit of copper and a bit of silver to mercury, you get a material that turns into a kind of putty. If you press that into the cavity of your tooth, wait three seconds, it becomes as hard as it is in your mouth now. If you can just feel your cavity and that amalgam filling I've got on here, and that, that has saved me losing that tooth. It saved me a, a world of pain. <laughs> and all right, so now we don't have amalgams. In fact, you do on the HS if you haven't gotten up. Right? They, they, that's the base they give you. There's, also, there's new ones that match the tooth color, and they, they're made from UV cure resins. And UV cure resins um, essentially are, are, you know, come from oil, polymers. So we've created these materials, all of them, to become who we are. We are clever. But each one of them solves a problem for us. Each one is who we are. Um, and if you want to understand that stuff I was just talking about, the idea that you can do a bit of magic, you can turn mercury into something that saves, saves you a lot of pain in your life, creates a different person. Because if you've ever lived with toothache for more than a day or two, you know you're not really the same person. Then this is essentially a map of what we've done. And I've, I've got, you know, to go with a the theme, I've got the biological world on this side and, and the man-made world on this side, and down the middle is scale. And this really is all you need to know about how materials work. It's, it's all about structure at different scales. So at the top, we have trees, whales, mice, fleas on mice, hairs on the fleas, and it turns out these hairs are made of tissues, which are you know, cellular, um, different types of cell, and if you zoom into those, you get individual cells, and if you zoom into those, you get macromolecules. So these are machines. Molecular machines, millions of atoms big, and they do things inside cells. They move bits from one side to the other. They allow the cell to change shape, to communicate with its neighbors. Um, and we're just getting to grips with how biology does this. It's got the most magic building block, the, the cell. 
and it can turn into teeth, it can turn into bone, it can turn into hair, it can turn into plastic skin. It's us. And we are, we are extraordinary things. We are these multi-scale uh, entities. And when something happens, like uh, a gene changes down here, that doesn't magically change your eye color or magically give you cancer. It, it filters all the way up the structural scales. It changes the cells, the tissues, the hairs, and all these things. And then at our scale, our human scale, the scale that we interact, you notice the behavior change. And, and similarly, the other way around is also true. So you change something up here, the environment, lack of water, amount of energy, and that turns on genes. So, so we are living materials, living stuff, and um, we are multi-scale. Multi now, on, on, the, on the material side of things, all these things like steel and concrete and plastics and, and mobile phones and buildings, the things we've heard about today, they are all made of different materials. And if you zoom into them, just like I just did then, you find these different structures that we've, we've actually created. So inside your mobile phone, the structure that knows which way up it is so that your picture changes to be the right way up, that's one of these. That's what it looks like. And it's not even very big. It's, the feature size is smaller than the hair on a flea, but it, if you looked inside your mobile phone to find it, you'd find a little speck. But you'd be able to see it. If you zoom into that, you find these crystals in the same way that if you zoom into your tooth filling or you zoom into a girder of a steel building. And if you can control these crystals, then you can control the strength of the steel or the way that your filling in your, in your mouth suddenly hardens. And so this, this is the essence of alchemy. And it's also what the blacksmith's doing when they're hitting, <laughs> they're hitting a piece of metal to make a horseshoe, is they're not just changing the shape of the steel, they are changing the crystal structure. And they knew this. They had this knowledge in their hands. It's not that they didn't know as much as us, but they knew some things we've forgotten. And they had an intimate relationship with that material. The best steel ever made is, was made in the 16th century by the samurai in Japan. We still can't make a steel as good as that. Well, we could if we tried, but the point is this, that, that they, they did that without any electron microscopes, without knowing half the periodic table, without really knowing that it was carbon they were mucking about with. And yet, and so that's the journey that's, that's, that we've been on as, as a civilization, creating new materials to solve problems. And actually, what we've been doing is discovering the inner, inner scaling structure of all these different things. So down here is the nanoscale, and people are very excited about nanoscale technology because it's the same scale as the inside of cells. And this stuff inside cells self-assembles. So cells just do it themselves. They make new versions of themselves. They look after themselves. They turn into bone or plastic. And so when you take that stuff out of a cell and put it into a test tube, it works. So there's self-assembling that you can do outside. So materials self-assemble. Crystals form themselves. Crystals heal themselves. So it's all very exciting. And this is, this is really what the 20th century was all about. In a way, I mean, the most beautiful moment of the 20th century, undoubtedly, in my opinion, is, 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 is getting to the moon, right? Humans walking on the moon. It's just the most poetic. It's a piece of art, really. And it's a real expression of our ambition. But it's, it's really about the fact that we kind, of, we kind of worked all this stuff out. Now, we're in the 21st century, and we have a different problem, which is that having produced all this stuff in the kind of rush of kind of how clever we are, and it is impressive, we have a problem with global warming, we have a problem with water shortages, we have inequality everywhere we look. And when we try and solve it, of course, we do what we've always done. We just try and make our way out of it, make our way out of the problem. We had toothache, so we made amalgams. Now we have... We have no renewable energy, so we make solar cells. And of course, it's exactly the same, right? You just have to work out the molecular structures you need for sunlight to hit to convert an electron into a conduction band, capture that electron, recharge a battery, or put it into the net, into the grid. And in some ways, you think, well, hey, we'll just build our way out of this problem. Surely, solar cells are just going to solve it for us. But I don't think it is going to be that simple, and I think probably none of us here do. And it's not for lack of knowledge, it's for lack of understanding the complexity of the thing that we've created, this urban landscape full of materials that we made. And nature is this complex too, is more complex, has mastered all these scales, but has had 3.2 billion years to work out the ramifications of that. <laughs> and we're just, it's just dawning on us. 
Okay, so Tesla car, this looks like a solution to a problem. It's our unusual way of solving a problem. Do something marvelous, really marvelous, and it is. But this car is made of carbon fiber. Well, the shell, right? Why? Because carbon fiber is light, strong, stiff, and you don't have much energy in a Tesla car because it's all in the battery. So you really want to make this thing as light as possible, and carbon fiber is it. But look, look at what carbon fiber does for you. Um, you can make, in fact, most airplanes are made out of carbon fiber for the same reason. And, you know, if you own a decent bike, it's carbon fiber. And this is what it looks like. It's, a, it's a, basically a fabric. And in order to make the fabric carbon fiber um, coherent and not break up, you have an epoxy resin that, that surrounds it. And so the resin surrounds all this stuff, and you get this light, strong, stiff material. And what, what we would like to do is, instead of using normal carbon fiber, which is essentially amorphous, We'd like to use these new materials we've discovered. Nobel Prize for Physics in 2010 was for graphene. Here it is, even stronger and stiffer. So we'd like to build, and we could use nanotubes, we'd like to build our carbon fiber out of this stuff and make this stronger, stiffer, these bigger and lighter. But the problem is that we don't know how to recycle carbon fiber. It's unrecyclable. So we're, we're in a sense, rushing in one direction to solve a problem. And we haven't even sorted out whether actually we should be using carbon fiber at all, because shouldn't we be thinking first about a material that is recyclable before we build thousands, millions of them, and then they end up somewhere, well, with our Swedish, right? <laughs> They're just going to end up there, right? And, and, and people go, oh my God, what are we going to do with this stuff? And this is the problem that we've, we have never had to really deal with, is that we never designed things and thought about where they're going to end up. Um, milk bottles. Okay, so this happened again, right? So you would think, here's a, here's a poly, high density polyethylene milk bottle. In this country, this is what you get your milk in. It is recyclable. You can see it's recyclable. <laughs> um, it's quite a good material for recycling, except for one thing the color of the cap. That's also made of high density polyethylene, but it's green. So when you put this through the recycling route, you can recover the poly, high density polyethylene. Now, this is a thermoplastic, so you can just melt it. But the green dye won't, be, won't let go of the carbon polyethylene molecules. It just won't let go of them. So when you go round the loop once, this gets greener, and then greener and greener, until the milk looks a bit off. And of course, you guessed it, no one wants that stuff. So you can recycle it, but if, if it affects the product that in the, in the end that you and I want to buy, then it's no good. Answer? It's clear what the answer is, right? Make the caps clear. Just don't color any of it. And if you think about how many bits of plastic you have in your life that are colored, it's almost all unrecyclable. It's almost all going to be downgraded into something less valuable than the thing it came from. When the producers of this were challenged on this, and the supermarkets really have most of the power on this, they said that the consumers, I hate that word, um, the, drink, the milk drinkers, us all, right? We want that cap. That's what they say. We want it. Proof? We buy it that way. And I think there is a circular <laughs> argument there which, which is not a good thing. So there's lots, there's lots of things to be done. We, talk, we saw some designers here. I mean, design is a big part of this problem and a big part of the solution. Um, and I was just going to say, well, high-density polyethylene, I mean, it's even this, and it's a great material for milk. It's great. You're thinking, maybe, I remember what was in glass, and you just gave them back, and surely that's a better solution. But on the way back, you've got an empty truck full of glass, and glass is heavy, it's 10 times heavier than this, and it breaks, this is very tough. So you get loss of glass, you use energy in getting the glass back, and it turns out when you do the energy, when you look at the whole energy solution, that plastic, in this case, is a much better way of doing this. But what you want it is to be fully recyclable. And you have choices, right? So these are the different structures inside that bottle, and these are kind of semi-crystalline states of the polymer. When these start to break down, because it's been through the loop so many times, then the properties of this get poor. So you have to constantly add virgin polyethylene in. And so this isn't fully recyclable. It never will be, unless you go right down to the monomer, where it was ethylene. And the problem with that is it costs you a lot of energy. So as you start to analyze any of these circles, it, the, the questions keep coming, and the answers are very few and far between. This is a compact fluorescent bulb. It's it's environmentally sound, in quotes, but look at these are all the elements in it to make it, including mercury, by the way, including europium, 
including tungsten. Now, tungsten obviously was in the old light bulbs too. And that's a highly complex set of elements to be digging out of the ground and to be recycling. This is a jet engine, equally complex, rhenium, rhodium, lanthanides, tungsten, tantalum. This has a much longer lifespan, hugely long, it's 30, 30 or so years. So this is fine if you need something that's going to be that high end, that, that performance heavy. But should a light bulb have that many? These are questions that we all have to kind of grapple with. Mobile phone has half the elements of the periodic table in it, right? including gold, as we heard earlier. So, gadolinium, I mean, American. I mean, is this really where we want to be going? And I think it comes back to this kind of iron-steel thing. Like, um, there's a Bronze Age. Bronze Age goes into the Iron Age. Why? No one really knows. Lots of the tin for the bronze, to make the bronze, came from Cornwall, not down from, far from here. And the other stuff came from Afghanistan. And the center of the world at the time was the, was the Mediterranean Roman. And they were Bronze Age. Bronze Age, Bronze Age is a great material. And then there's a, there's a moment where it all goes haywire, and then iron arrives. And the answer, my answer, to why the Iron Age is after the Bronze Age is not because iron is easier to make. It's not. It's much higher temperatures. And actually, controlling the alloy content of an iron is really sophisticated, whereas anyone can make a bronze. The answer is that tin was really hard to get hold of, had long supply routes. And if they got disrupted, your local community, which you didn't go out of, was suddenly without this material you really needed. Whereas, if you all go for the walk, you will see red stones or red tin stones everywhere. Iron is everywhere. Right? Iron is everywhere, and once you get it out, once you smelt it, it's in, almost infinitely recyclable. There are, there are people saying today that there's enough iron around in the infrastructure. We, we, we don't ever have to mine anymore again, even with nine billion people. So iron is one of those materials you sort of think, well, maybe we should restrict ourselves to materials that actually are recyclable. Um, and that, those are the kind of questions I think we really have to ask. We've talked about materials a bit, like they're blobs, different colored blobs of thing, and they're not. They are as complex as the biological world with all the different structures. And the more technologically adept we've got with laptops and phones and, and even clothes, the more structure we've put in them. And 90% of the value is those structures. It's not the atoms, it's the structures. And as soon as you put this into a melting pot, you lose 90% of your value. So, so, so planning for the longevity of an object or a material is a much smarter thing to do if you want it to be sophisticated. And planning for simplicity is a much smarter thing to do if you want it to go around the recycle route a lot of times. Um, and yeah, at the Institute of Making, I think we, we basically just sort of decided that we have to kind of get everyone involved in this, that, that, that this is not a problem that scientists are going to solve on their own. We've been very clever up to now, but we don't have the skills to think of all the social issues, the making issues, all the circular economy issues. Um, anyway, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for listening.